Welcome to episode 7A of Saying Something Sober, the podcast where I decide the topic and it could be literally anything. In today's topic, Straightjacket, Overcoming Society's Legacy of Gay Shame by Matthew Todd. Part 1, Shame. So, yeah. As just mentioned, the book itself is split into three parts, that being shame, escape, and recovery. And this episode will focus on the first part, shame, and there will be a further two parts to this podcast episode on escape and then recovery. So let's get right into it. This book is quite heavily acclaimed. I was recommended it multiple times by multiple unconnected people. And the edition that I have has reviews all over the cover, um, specifically one from Elton John that says, this is an essential read for every gay person on the planet. I would agree, especially gay people in the UK. It talks a lot about the kind of history and implications of gay issues, but with a context that is very relevant for the UK. Like it talks about schools and the education system and the government quite a bit and the media. And I think that's what makes it so relatable for, for me, especially. Whereas something like the Velvet Rage, which I covered a few episodes ago, that was quite American, but it didn't rely so heavily on the American culture as much. I think this book does so far rely more on the UK culture. But I'll read the blurb. It says, Straightjacket is a revolutionary clarion call for gay men, the wider LGBT community, their friends and family. Part memoir, part groundbreaking polemic. It looks beneath the shiny facade of contemporary gay culture and asks if gay people are as happy as they could be. And if not, why not? Meticulously researched, courageous and life-affirming, Straightjacket offers invaluable practical advice on how to overcome a range of difficult issues, including depression, drug abuse, and sex addiction. It also recognizes that this is a watershed moment, a piercing call to arms for the gay and wider community to acknowledge the importance of supporting all young people and helping older people to transform their experience and finally get the lives they really want. Now, obviously, what I have just touched upon on the blurb means that this episode and all future parts of this topic will come with huge, massive trigger warnings. In the prologue, it quotes an extract that is transcribed from the 1967 BBC Two documentary, Man Alive, Consenting Adults, Part One, The Men. I think I've seen clips of this documentary before, um, but it interviews gay men at the time of 1967, where obviously there was a lot of negativity around. But I just want to pull out one key quote before I get into why the book was written. So the gay man being interviewed says, I know that I'm probably different to a lot of normal other homosexuals. They probably went round to toilets to find someone to have sexual relations with, but I wanted someone for company. I just wanted to pull that out because I think there's a key element of internalized homophobia there that a lot of us probably relate to, which is this feeling that we're made to feel that we're different to the other gross, disgusting gays. But reality, that's just what we've been coded to believe that gays are like. And so naturally, we're trying to differentiate ourselves from from that. But in reality, what we should be doing is dismantling that idea and supporting the entire community and understanding that people are complicated. Just to call out that what I will get into in this episode is quite dark. I've already given a trigger warning, but it is quite depressing and I will probably be quite vulnerable. And though that is the reality of life, we kind of have to keep on track of improvement and evolution. So it's equally important to kind of remember how far we've come, despite all of the kind of dark historical stuff that I will touch upon. That kind of positivity and celebration of how far we've come is recognized on page four to five in the prologue. And I just want to read this extract. 
As I raised my elderflower fizz, I looked around at all the smiling faces. David's parents, Adrian's mother and stepfather. Children playing on the decking. Single people flirting and couples dancing the evening away. Straight, gay, differences didn't matter. My mum was there too. My date, beaming, being given handbag tips by my friend Lee, who is Chinese and calls everybody darling. She had such good times she had missed her train and had to stay in a hotel. I stopped and thought, we finally got there. And it isn't just legal equality. Over the last 20 years, I've noticed so many wonderful moments of sheer joy in my friends' lives. Friends' parents making a civil partnership speech where they welcome their son's partner formally into their family. Another friend, Irish, delighting his Muslim partner, now husband, with the surprise 40th birthday party where we, his gay and straight friends, took over a seaside hotel for the weekend. Then a few years later, his Muslim relatives joining their civil partnership party. More recently, another young Facebook friend, Matthew, posting a picture of his Christian parents hugging and kissing him in full drag at Belfast's Gay Pride in 2015. He, like many of my friends, living healthily and proudly with HIV. My trans friends finally getting a modicum of respect they deserve, and lesbian women coming to the fore as Ruth Hunt took over Stonewall. The changes are so positive and so immense that considered in any depth, they would easily move most of us to tears of joy. Obviously, the author, Matthew Todd, is keeping the air of optimism, but he has to ground it in what he is then going on to talk about. So on page nine in the introduction, he says, it is becoming increasingly clear that a disproportionate number of us are not thriving as we should. Maybe it was always so. Maybe technology means we are more aware of it now. Maybe the fight for equality stopped us from seeing it. And ultimately, I think that underpins what the book is trying to do. It's not trying to say that all is lost or that the world is this cruel place and we've gone kind of come nowhere. He's just acknowledging the fact that potentially there is this issue that has been neglected since this political achievement was achieved. Before I get into the actual meat of the part, I'm going to linger slightly on the introduction and just talk about who Matthew Todd is. So he's a British writer, editor, and occasional stand-up comedian, says Wikipedia. But he's obviously also the author of this book. In, in the book, he talks about his time as the editor at Attitude magazine, which is obviously the gay British magazine. And in the introduction, he states, what convinced me to write this book was that I had observed these patterns amongst people I know and have grown up with. So ultimately, he is a, a gay man that witnessed these gay issues and decided to do something about it. And that is very respectable. I mean, the things that he talked about, I've witnessed myself and I've kind of concretely thought about these things like why do they exist why do we all seem to have this element of damage in us on page 10 he kind of summarizes what the book is going to touch on disproportionately high levels of depression self-harm and suicide not uncommon problems with emotional in intimacy people keeling over dead in saunas the highest rates of HIV infection since the epidemic began in the 1980s, and now a small but significant subculture of men who are using, some injecting, seriously dangerous drugs, which, despite accusations of hysteria from the gatekeepers of the gay PR machine, are killing too many people. It is the irony of ironies that the word we chose for ourselves, gay, which originally meant jolly, carefree, and happy, has come to describe a group of people who can collectively appear anything but. So key to pull out from that quote is that this book was written and published around 2015 and 2016. So there are some kind of updates that it on the topics that it's talking about, but also there are some slight subtle hints that it was written in that period. For example, uh, here it talks about the highest rates of HIV infection since the epidemic began. 
But I think in the past kind of couple of years, that's definitely been curved by the release of PrEP to the public. Um, obviously, PrEP protects people from contracting HIV, even if they've been exposed. Um, and also, I know that in 2021 or 2022, it was the first year that more straight people contracted HIV than gay people. But the point still stands that since the epidemic began, HIV is still this, this issue or this idea around it. There's this stigma. Regardless, what I think Matthew is touching upon is, is very poignant to today. I think I've seen it myself, the culture that exists in the gay community is one that seems to encourage the festering of our own dark, deep thoughts. No one seems to want to talk about seriously these problems and where they come from. They just see them as problems and and don't see the connection to LGBTQ+. It seems to me at least that the issues are identified as issues by everyone, but then to suggest that it's connected to our sexualities is a step too far because we're making it ev everything about our sexuality or that kind of ethos is brought into it. But that kind of ethos seems to neglect the fact that we were gay growing up and we were gay growing up in a time that told us and taught us that that was wrong. And we haven't really seen or experienced the impacts of that fully yet. We are only kind of seeing it happen now. And that's what the book is trying to identify. What, what are those impacts? Why is there this epidemic of these problems? Potentially there's, they're connected. I mean, I would agree that they are connected from my own experience of my own problems, not just what I've seen. Matthew Todd also gives context as to why the book is called what it's called. He states, the damage is done to us by growing up strapped inside a cultural straitjacket, a tight fitting one size restraint imposed on us at birth that leaves no room to grow outside its narrow confines. And that's on page 11 in the introduction. The idea of a straight jacket is something we all understand and all grew up with. We think of growing up gay as being in a closet and it's a lot more restricted than that, or at least it was for me. I'm going to talk very heavily about my own experience and I think it's hard for me to quantify what it is like today for kids growing up. From things that I hear, it, it is better. That doesn't mean it's perfect. Matthew Todd also gives some context as to the purpose behind the book. He says, By writing this book, I hope to provoke a discussion and suggest real change. It is written from my own perspective as a white gay man, though I am fully aware that the issues I raise are pertinent to bisexual men and women, lesbians, transgendered men and women, and those who consider themselves queer, non-binary, and slash or intersex. And that is really a, a great purpose. It's kind of what I've just touched upon is that to actually identify accurately what, what these issues are and why there's this shared feeling of trauma or emotional issues, why do they exist and what are they and how do we fix it? The only way to do that is to start the conversation. He continues, culturally, homosexuality and misery have been linked so tightly over the years that they have become an offensive cliche to the point where any discussion of problems is dismissed as homophobia. And that's a very good point. I mentioned earlier that we recognize that there are problems. We recognize that there are a higher proportion of people who are addicted to drugs that are in the gay community. But as soon as you start to suggest that that is to do with sexuality, you're met with the idea that you can't say that it's homophobic, or you're met with the idea that you're making everything about sexuality. It's not all to do with sexuality, but that doesn't allow for an open and honest conversation. The only way that we can prove 
that this is wrong, if you believe that it's wrong, is to talk about it, is to bring up the possibility that it's to do with sexuality or that it's to do with identity. I think it's got to come from somewhere. People are not addicted to drugs simply because they just are. There's a reason. There's a source of the problem. And that's where we need to tackle it, not not from anywhere else. Cut the tree down from the root. He also refers to addiction as humanity's story, which is a very beautiful way to put something so difficult to talk about because addiction is so often portrayed as the responsibility of the individual. It's, it's actually part of the reason so many people and even myself don't realize or didn't realize that they had a problem because this idea of what an addict is, is so much further from what it can be. It can be so much more than what we think it is. We think addicts are homeless. We think they are lives falling apart, all of these things. And that is definitely a reality for some people, but the vast majority of people, it's not the vast majority of people live their lives in misery and live their lives in unmanageability, but don't recognize it because they're not an addict. They, they've still got a job. They're not an addict. They've still got a house and all of these things. And that just contributes to the problem. Considering addiction as humanity's story is accepting the responsibility on all of us for the problem. It's very, very similar to the idea of climate change or the environmental crisis. The environmental crisis is our responsibility because of what we did to the environment. Drug addiction is our responsibility because of what we did to people. I'll close off quoting the introduction with one final quote. I realized I've quoted a lot in the first 20 minutes of this podcast. So I'll try and close it down and start talking about the meat. But he says, if we really have the gritty determination that is so popular in the anthems commonly played in gay clubs and homes across the world, then the time has finally arrived to face the storm and find our way out the other side. And that's on page 14. Reading this book so far has been really great. I relate so heavily to it. It's especially the section on coming out is almost like exactly what my story is like. It felt like I was reading my own story. I really liked the almost biographical mixed with historical approach to a lot of the topics. And I especially liked his metaphorical and symbolic way of expressing what he meant and what he was discussing. That is very much the way that I think and the way that I like to use language. It reminds me of the way that I write poetry and why I write poetry, because I find that metaphors, analogies, and like symbolism is the best way to get my point across because sometimes it's hard to verbalize what you're trying to say. But also this book has allowed me to reflect a lot, especially in my childhood. I hadn't realized how much of it I had blocked out or couldn't remember. And it allowed me to reflect and start recalling things that I hadn't necessarily forgotten, but hadn't yet thought about in this context. And then connect the dots between each of those experiences. It starts to let me like fill in the painting. If each section of this book is a paint by numbers, then I'm filling out my own paint by numbers with what it gives me. And that's really nice. I mean, I hadn't realized how much of my childhood I'd forgotten. So moving swiftly on to part one, shame. Now, part one is split into six sections. And the first one is entitled Gay Men Don't Get Old. And on page 25, he quotes something that explains why this section is called that. Almost like when you're watching a film and they say the name of the film, like in Love Actually, there's that bit where they go, Love actually is 
all around. It's like that. I'm reading the book and then the quote for the name of the section comes up and I'm like, oh, look at that. But he says on page 25, since I started writing this book, more people have approached me for help or given me similar accounts. A friend who disappears for days on end, another who is hooked on drugs, another asking for help for his friend who caught HIV and hepatitis C after getting involved in the chemsex scene. I've lost count of those stories, which are overwhelming in their number and similarity. Low self-esteem, body image issues, depression and anxiety are the cornerstones of the way these problems manifest. When I began writing in 2011, one man told me of his ex-boyfriend, whose drug use had led him to losing his home. He was living on his friend's sofa, having unsafe sex with large numbers of men and was addicted to crystal meth. He didn't see a reason to live, his friend told me, because, as he put it, gay men don't get old. And this touches upon a huge problem that I witness in the gay community, which is the issue around age, the issue around aging. In The Velvet Rage, Alan talks about it a little bit, about how we see old gay men as these bitter queens who waste away, but aging is a gift. Aging is something that we should regard as a gift. Every gray hair, every wrinkle should be a badge of honor on your chest of the things that you've experienced, the life that you've led. But gay men are so obsessed with not just youth, but the things that come with it, slenderness, smooth skin, all of these qualities, partying. The example that Matthew gives from his friend is obviously one that is extreme, that the boyfriend, ex-boyfriend lost his home. But stories like that, maybe not in as much severity, stories like that are in abundance, in abundance that I've seen. And we just accept it. I mean, I've talked about many times with my friends and with maybe even on here about how I really didn't have a plan for my life beyond the age of like 18, 21, 23, because I genuinely didn't think that I'd get there. I genuinely thought that by then I would be dead. I would have done it or something would have happened. I had this feeling in me that I wasn't born to live to old age. One really dark night when I was a teenager, I remember I had essentially a panic attack, an anxiety attack, just a burst of emotion of sadness. I cried for hours because I realized that I was going to have to live for almost quadruple the time that I had already lived till I was like 70. And I couldn't bear the thought of that so much so that I just cried. I cried and cried. I had essentially a panic attack on my own in my bedroom because I was so just sad or depressed that I just didn't want to do life anymore. And the idea of having to do it five times more of what I've just done was horrific to me. And so now at the age of 25, the thing that I'm a celebrating is that I'm here every year that I am here. It's great. But also I find that I just don't know. I don't have a plan. I don't know what comes next and that's okay, but I never made a plan. So I don't have one from pages 21 to 23. Matthew gives a crazy list of stories of gay celebrities and gay notable people who committed suicide or who attempted. It's quite impactful the way that it's done because though I know some of this stuff, though I know some of this history, to have it laid out like this, play by play, it's immense. It's immense how much there is. And he even talks about how there's this curse of, of blaming gays for homophobia. He says, to suggest their deaths had anything at all to do with the fact that these men were gay seemed intrinsically homophobic and just well wrong. And that's the track. That's it. We're in this position where we all have this 
collective damage, this very similar damage between us, but we can't admit that it might be because of something that we worked so hard to accept. The idea that we've come to a place where we can finally say, I am proud to be who I am. And then we're faced with the reality that, that who we are has had a negative impact on us. That that's difficult to accept, but it's not who we are that's had that impact. It's the world in which we've grown up in as who we are. Another thing that I really like about this book is the references and scientific evidence that it quotes and the statistics that it provides are quite immense. On page 21, it states LGB people used drugs and alcohol at seven times the rate of the general population and that they were twice as likely to binge drink. Now that for me is completely and entirely believable because of my own experience and what I've witnessed, what I've done myself. And it's culturally ingrained, you know, the gay community is seen as a party community. And though that's not necessarily a problem in itself, it's what is allowed to, to grow within that idea that becomes a problem. We're a party community. We are chaotic. We love fun. So that means going really hard, binge drinking, doing loads and loads of drugs is, is okay. No, we need to take stock and recognize the impact of doing those things too much, too often, and what it can ultimately, ultimately mean down the line. In the long list of stories of gay celebs and gay notable people Matthew talked about one that I specifically want to call out because of how impactful it was to me as I read it. So he talked about Eric Rhodes, who was a porn star that he met due to his work, Jude Magazine. And Eric Rhodes died from a heart attack due to heavy steroid use in 2012 at the age of 30, which is extremely, extremely young. Um, but he had previously created a blog entitled A Romance with Misery. On that, he wrote, I feel so left out, so alone. And his last entry ever read, We all knew this is where I'd end up. All the pills in the world can't change the fact that I have lost my passion for almost everything in life. And I just don't care anymore. And if I'm dead when this is finally read, we'll just know I was dead when I wrote it. And obviously that closing statement is heartbreaking because I think it talks about this epidemic, this issue that seems to engross all of us gay people, which is we live our lives in a way that is neglecting checking that trauma, checking all of the stuff that we've got in our head that we're unwilling to face. And so then we lead ourselves down a road where we lose our passion for life. We lose our reason for living. And if we lose that, then we feel as if it's not worth being alive. And so we are essentially dead already. And that means that doing all of these crazy things and behaving in the way that we do, behaving in this chaotic way is okay because it doesn't matter. I, I definitely heavily relate to that idea. I, I concretely remember times where I had partied too hard and I had this recklessness deep inside of me. And the logical side of my brain would say, oh, but what about this? What about your safety? What about that? And instantly my reaction would be, it doesn't matter. Who cares? If something happens, it happens. And that is a really scary place to be. And since I started my journey, I have witnessed it take more of a back seat, but occasionally it does rear its head again. I had an experience at the weekend where that came back slightly because of feelings that I was feeling due to a situation that I'd been put in by some friends that it wasn't, it wasn't anyone's fault, but those feelings came back because I was alone. And I was annoyed and I was upset. And those feelings came back of like, well, why don't you just go do this? 
It doesn't matter. Who cares? You have to stop and check it. You have to push that back and say, I care or someone cares, anything. But it's quite a, a scary place to find yourself in. One thing I will say about this book is that I'm not going to shy away from disagreeing what it says. And there are a couple points at which I disagree with what Matthew is writing. Not necessarily that I think he is wrong at times, but more so that I see it differently. In this example that I'm about to give, I do personally believe that what he's saying is incorrect, but I understand why he's saying it. So he says, it is important, though, to understand that most gay people do not go through the extreme things described here. If you are upset by this book, especially if you are young and slash or just coming out, know that the future is not written. And I understand that he is saying that because we need to be optimistic. We need to present a future to young people that isn't depressing, that isn't dark, that is worth living towards we need to present this optimistic future and i understand that but i also think it's important to embrace the reality of the problem and he says that most gay people do not go through these extreme things depending on what he's referring to as extreme things i would argue that more go through it than don't but that's just my perspective that's just my opinion and I'm using my own experience to inform that. Most of the gay people that I've come across, I do witness these experiences and these problems there. And I've had conversations with most of them about these things and they agree. So I understand that there needs to be this optimistic presentation, but it's important, I think, to relay at the same time the reality of the problem. Matthew understands that point, Matthew seems to portray that he understands that this problem is huge and that it exists beneath the surface in a way that if we were to just go about our day, we probably wouldn't see it. He gives a really good analogy using the boiling frog experiment on tw page 25. And he says that he can't be the only person who has had these experiences, but that the situation seems to be like the boiling frog experiment. Drop a frog in boiling water and it will react immediately, hopping out as quickly as possible. But put it in a saucepan of cool water and gently heat it up and it won't notice anything is wrong. And ultimately, that's why this problem is so insidious because a lot of people won't accept or realize that they are the boiling frog in the cool but increasingly hot water. I see it as you never really notice that your hair is growing until one day you wake up and look in the mirror and go, oh my God, my hair is so long. So you never really notice that these problems are getting worse and that you are getting sadder or more miserable or that you're struggling to manage more. But one day you will wake up and realize, I can't do this. And it's just be about being prepared with all the tools that you need for that day, for when you hit that rock bottom. At least that's how it was for me. I one day hit a rock bottom about just under eight months ago. I kind of had a come to moment, almost like a, an epiphany where I just realized I can't do this anymore. I can't do this kidding myself thing anymore. And luckily for me, very, very fortunately, I had a certain person that I could go to that coincidentally was top of mind at the time. Had that not been the case, I don't, I don't know where I would be. I am lucky enough to have been prepared by chance with the tools that I needed at the time. Maybe for people listening, have a think. If you were to hit a rock bottom right now, who would you call? And what would they say? There's one more thing that I want to touch upon from this section. He touches upon gay men that lie about their age. And that is something that I've personally experienced twice with people that I've dated. So I had a relationship that went on for about three years. But when we first started dating, I was led to believe that he was 27 and I was 19 at the time, which as I look back, I was too young. I was, I was naive and 
there were a lot of things that happened throughout the course of the relationship that had I been who I am now, I wouldn't have let slide. But I was 19. I thought I'd found the one. I thought that this was it. And I thought that that's just how love was. I thought that's how relationships were. And if you wanted it to work, you wanted it to work. And if you didn't, you broke up with them. And I didn't want to break up with them because I thought that was it. I found out about a month in to dating when we were kind of already going pretty steady because everything moved so fast. But I found out a month in that he was actually five years older than he told me. And I remember thinking when he told me, oh, that's fine. Having this deep discomfort with it, but being like, it's fine. But I was, I was naive and I thought age was just a number. And I do still hold that belief to a degree. I just think there's a certain period of time between when you're 18 and 21 to 23, where you are still figuring stuff out as an adult, especially as a gay person. I didn't really discover who I was. I still haven't really, but I didn't really start doing that until I was at uni. So anything from 18 to 23, I wasn't really certain on who I was. And I think that period of time, you're, you're impressionable and you are very easy to lead because you are so hopeful about life. And I was, and it's not that I regret it, but it's more that that damage, that, that stuff that I'd experienced that wasn't necessarily what I signed up for could have been avoided. The second time that I experienced it was, was last year. I was at the peak of my unmanageability and I entered into a relationship that just accelerated that unmanageability and actually led me to my rock bottom. And that relationship, there was a, a definite lack of clarity of how old he was which is just part of this whole problem. I don't hold it against them because ultimately the gay community is built in a way that celebrates youth and pushes older people to, to the sidelines because they're bitter queens or they're wrinkly old men, they're gross, they're this, but that's just not reality. And in fact, the gay community of all communities should be celebrating parading and thanking all of the older people for where they've gotten us, but also what they've been through. I myself did not live through the HIV epidemic, but I know people that did. The gay community would turn a blind eye to them because of their age. Next section is entitled, I'd shoot my son if he had AIDS, says Vicar, roosting chickens which is a reference to some of the headlines that were published by The Sun during the AIDS epidemic, which Matthew Todd goes into detail on pages 36 to 38 about The Sun's publishing of the AIDS epidemic. And I'm not going to quote it. I'm not going to touch upon it because honestly, fuck The Sun. Read the book. That's what I would implore you to do. But that section just proves to me how insidious and vile the sun and media vehicles like it are. They are just disgusting. However, one important discussion that Matthew Todd raises is the idea of nature versus nurture. And he asks, what does it mean to be gay? But he also states, I write from the perspective that sexual orientation is set before birth and is not a choice. And this is on page 32. And like I said, I will be honest about the elements of the book that I disagree with. And I understand the perspective of, of just nature being the reason for sexuality. But I've always held the belief that it's a mix of both, that if you hold up nature versus nurture for the reasoning as to why someone is gay, it's always a case of being both. And for every individual gay person, it's a different weighting of, of both. 
for some one person, it might be 70% because of the genes that they have. But for somebody else, it might be more 50-50 split genes to nurture because I don't and can't believe that it is 100% either. And that's because if it's 100% nature, then that line of logic would lead us to believe that there's a cure, that we can find which gene it is and we can eradicate it. And that's not something that I want. However, similarly on the, the other side, if it's 100% nurture, then we're able to find the situations that cause that. And it leads into stereotypes like, oh, they're a mummy's boy, or the dad was not around, or they had a bad relationship with their father. It leads all those things to be true. There's some scientific research out there recently that suggests that children who are the second child or that have older siblings have a higher likelihood to be gay. And the theory goes that on a biological level, we are animals that are built to prolong the bloodline. And so if you are the younger sibling, biologically, you're more likely to be gay because you don't need to have kids because the older sibling will have them and you'll be there to help care for them and prolong the bloodline. And that's why that would lead to nature. And there's obviously examples of gay people out there who are only children or don't have any older siblings and only have younger siblings. So that only really explains part of the story. and. To believe that all the younger siblings are gay is just not reality. So there's got to be more to it. There's got to be a nurture side to it as well. People have a biological likelihood to be gay, but it needs a certain scenario or factors in their nurturing for them to end up being gay. That would be my perspective. And I think if you lead with a hundred percent one way or the other, the line of logic to me is scary and dangerous. Matthew makes an important point on, on this topic on page 32. He states, why not? If it were a choice, it would be fun to choose a different type of person next. I'm not looking to make a statement for or against the patriarchy. I'm looking for love and someone to watch Coronation Street with. I would have done anything to be like everybody else rather than endure the years of isolation I suffered. And that is a key point. Regardless of your perspective of nature versus nurture, you have to believe that it's not a choice, because if it were, why would we choose this? Do you also quantifies something that I have myself referenced and spoke about to people, which is about self-taught anxiety. On page 44, he states, like the Terminator, we learn to scan new environments for potential threats. Can we be ourselves? Do we have to tone down our mannerisms? You mention our partners. Is this bus safe for us? Can I come out to this new job? And that ultimately is something that comes with us from our days growing up gay. I learned kids at school thought that swaying your butt too much was gay. So I physically changed the way that I walked. And to this day, that's how I walk. I taught myself anxiety growing up because I taught myself to question every little thing that I was witnessing and experiencing about my own behavior, about everyone else's behavior. Are they looking at me too much? Does that mean that they know? Are they going to do something about it? And I still have that to this day. I still walk about in public and have this inner voice, this anxiety about why someone's looking at me. Am I acting too gay? Am I this? Am I that? And I'm not sure that that will ever go away. But over the years, I've gotten a lot better at just not listening to it. It's something that's always there, but it's not something that I pick up on or listen to. I just want to comment on the discussion of Section 28, which is a divisive bill that was passed by Margaret Thatcher in the 1980s. And that's why LGBT Q plus history month is in February in the UK, because that was the month that it was gotten rid of. And if you don't know what section 28 is, read this book or research section 28, because the vagueness and ambiguity that was built into it from the get go, and that was allowed to be passed is what led to essentially the second illegalization of homosexuality. 
it doesn't matter that the bill only said the promotion of homosexuality. It's what it led to. People weren't allowed to talk about gayness. And so when they saw it on the street, that meant it was wrong. That meant that walking down the street as a feminine man was flaunting it. And that's the impact of a bill like that. It's divisive. And so when we're thinking about things like Section 28, we have to be thinking about not repeating that history. And the conversations and discourse that's happening right now around trans identities, around female bodies, around drag in America, these are similar conversations that lead to similar results. Bills are being passed in America that are very reminiscent of the ambiguity in Section 28. And I think it's really important that people know the history of Section 28. So moving on to the section called My Share. And I just want to say that I related so much to what he's saying and what he's telling about his story. It's almost like I'm reading my own coming out story. It's honestly kind of bizarre. And it kind of makes me want to talk about how at work recently, I shared a very detailed account of my coming out story on an all-staff email because of LGBTQ plus history month. And as part of that, I wanted to convey the reality of experience of gay experience to my straight colleagues, because I think so often people think that they understand because they've got this base knowledge of what coming out is, but they don't really get the depth and the vastness of it. I'll just read two short extracts from that write-up that I sent around to my colleagues. It starts, when I came out, I made a promise to myself to never hide who I am and always live out in the open. Have I always abided by that promise? Of course not. Have I always tried? Most definitely. A few weeks ago, I read a seminal and impactful book called The Velvet Rage by Alan Downs. In the book, he talks about the phenomenon of toxic shame seen in all men, but specifically discusses how it's seen and manifested in gay men. He does this through relating to specific stories of his clients. In the book, he states, virtually all of the gay men I work with agree on one thing. No matter how accepting society becomes, it is still very hard to be a gay man and a truly happy person. We have gained so much, but something critical is still missing. What he is referring to there is the journey that all gay and queer people are on. A journey I started before I even knew what gay was. I end that story like this. That journey I mentioned at the start isn't over for me. I don't think it ever ends. Coming out is seen as the destination, but I disagree. Coming out isn't the end goal, but the shifting of a very personal journey from internal to external, from enduring to enjoying. Joy is the goal, and maximizing happiness through authenticity is the path. I have come leaps and bounds, though. I began reading another book recently called Straight Jacket by Matthew Todd. In that book, he states, Like many millions, at 10 years of age, and for good many years after, I would have done anything to be like everybody else, rather than endure the years of isolation I suffered. And though that is concretely true, I can wholeheartedly say that now, at age 25, I cannot think of anything better than being gay, and I wouldn't change it for anything. Now, I wrote that and I shared it with my colleagues because I really think it's important for gay people to be visible and to consistently share our experience, which is why this section of Straight Jacket is so important and impactful because not only is he contextualizing everything that he is talking about in his own story, but he is being visible. He's sharing his story because that's the only way that we can tell people about the reality of these things. He states on page 49, I felt as if I was an alien. My self-consciousness got worse. I believed if people could sense the difference in me, I would be hurt, dead. If I wanted to survive, I had to be someone else. The pressure was immense. It was as if I were wearing a jacket with pockets that were being loaded with stones. I became clingy, constantly afraid of abandonment. That is an extremely powerful extract, but also incredibly relatable. I think this idea of 
needing to be someone else is not necessarily an overly complex idea, but if you're gay and you grew up in the closet, you know the depth with what he is saying there. And in that vein, on page 53, he talks about canning up campness and he says, playing up to the camp stereotype and so at least gaining some control over the bullying, causing it, reaffirming it, exploiting it, reveling in it, using it to oppress myself. I was stuck in a cycle of being defiantly encouraging others to view me as a freak so that I could feel in control by feeling unworthy and unwanted. That last bit of that extract really puts things in place for me. I was definitely someone who used to amp up my campness or my gayness. I remember specifically first year of uni was definitely that world for me. I found myself in a lot of situations with especially straight men where I felt extremely other and different and like they were staring at me as this weird thing and I had experiences of homophobia. I remember one time I was at the bus stop waiting to go out. I was with my flatmates and a guy or a group of guys comes up to me obviously noticing that I'm gay and he's like would you rather give me a blowjob or take it up the arse or something and I play up to it. I ham into it. I'm and I give him an answer, whereas really I should just tell him to leave me alone. But I thought, you know, if I play into it, then I've got the power. I'm in control. But really, I was just reaffirming those subconscious beliefs that I wasn't worthy of value. He also states on page 53, someone hanging from the roof of a building with my fingers being unpicked one by one. And that is literally a image and thought that I've had very, very concretely before. So concretely that I've written a poem about that idea, about this idea of hanging from a cliff, a cliffhanger, feeling like someone is picking those fingers, just laughing at you as you are about to plummet to your death. He then goes to kind of touch upon a topic that is kind of difficult, I think, to talk about, but pervades the gay community, which is sex and specifically sex as this kind of transactional thing or this validating point of communion where you feel that your value is determined by if somebody wants to sleep with you. And he states, it felt like if people didn't want to sleep with you, they didn't want to know you. We seem to communicate only by having sex. And raising this topic actually kind of raises a difficult question for myself which is how many gay friends gay male friends do I have that I haven't slept with or I haven't had a sexual experience with and how many of my gay friends do I know have slept with each other and the kind of answer is is probably quite shocking and he goes on to talk about more broadly fun and obviously it's ironic that the word fun is the word that the grinder lingo has taken to mean sex. And he states on page 62 and 63, just have fun, the word that had come to define my existence. I was constantly looking for fun, having fun, advertising for fun, begging for fun, worrying about the fun I'd had, terrified that all the fun had given me a disease or was going to tip me over the edge. Fun was revolving round my head 24-7. Fun would see me log on to the internet as soon as I got home from work, talking on gaydar, desperate for a hookup, whilst keeping myself in the zone by downloading streams of other people having fun. After my last relationship ended, fun had become letting strangers into my house without a second thought. Fun saw me drunkenly t texting my friends, begging for sex. Fun saw me putting myself in dangerous and uncomfortable situations. Fun was m defining my relationships, dictating dictating how I led my life and leaving me in a state where once again suicide started to look like it might be a way out. What he talks about here is difficult because I think fun is obviously something that we should always desire. We should want to be fun people. Fun as chaos. Chaos being the fun is where it starts to get problematic and I think I definitely found myself in a space where how chaotic I was and how chaotic my weekend had been and how chaotic my night had been was like a badge of honor. I was 
leading my life with this mentality of like, I'm so crazy. Nothing can tame me. It's just not a healthy mentality or way to live. That recklessness catches up to you. And that's what I found. In that extract, he talks about going so far with fun that you're putting yourself in dangerous and uncomfortable situations. And I've done that to myself countless times to a point where I've concretely thought about how I'm in a dangerous situation. I'm in an uncomfortable situation. And the immediate response is, who cares? Because those suicidal ideations that I'd had for so long didn't just lead to suicidal ideas. If the danger was that somebody else was going to hurt me or somebody else was going to do it, then that also didn't matter in my head. He ends this extract by stating, fun just wasn't fun anymore. And I think that is a really important thing to keep in mind. When the fun stops being fun, stop. And what I've taken to do since I started my journey is if I'm on a night out with friends and I know it's going to be a late one, or even if I don't know if it's going to be a late one, if I think it's going to be an early one, wherever I am really, work drinks even, I'm regularly checking in with myself to see, do I want to go home? How am I feeling? Am I tired? Am I still having fun? Oftentimes I go home exactly at the point that I want to. You know, the, the latest I've been out was New Year's Day. And surprisingly, I stayed out till half five in the morning, which was crazy. And I'd kind of sustained myself on Red Bulls, but I'd had such a good time. And it was at the point that I thought I'm tired and I don't want to ruin my Sunday that I just went home because the fun stopped being fun. Moving on to the next section, which is called Growing Up Gay. Matthew starts it off quite strongly talking about the forgetting childhood aspect of growing up gay. He states, I doubt you recall how you lived with it week after week, month after month, year after year in those early days. Until recently, I couldn't remember much of my childhood either. And that's something that especially recently, I've realized is a reality for me. When I was writing that work coming out story to send around to everyone, I kind of realized that I don't quite remember the full details or the full scale. I can remember that that is how I felt, but I don't remember how it felt or day to day how I dealt with the weight of it. Beyond that, it's difficult for me to remember specific across my childhood and to be honest reading this book things started to come back to me and I started to realize how much I had forgotten and that leads on well to the point that he makes on page 66 which is I believe there's a reason we don't wish to think about how our childhood actually felt it's because it was too painful stating that is quite a mic drop moment for me at least because although I know that that is likely why I maybe have subconsciously blacked out a lot of my childhood to kind of concretely read someone suggests that it's true almost confirms those thoughts because up until now that thought hasn't necessarily been concrete and it's also been kind of questioned by my feeling that I'm just making it up to know that other people also have this blacking out of their childhood, especially in relation to specifically growing up gay, makes it also real. And in this section, Matthew uses it to not necessarily talk about his growing up gay because he's kind of already covered that, but more so the impact of it. The section is actually called Growing Up Gay, A Survival Bond, and it specifically touches upon the trauma and effect of growing up gay and the relationship with parents. In fact, on page 68, he states, Gerhat writes that not getting positive affirmation from a mother has a powerful impact on the growing child. It causes release of the stress hormone cortisol, which negatively affects the release of the pleasure chemicals, dopamine and endorphins. That kind of raises an alarm bell in my head because I've recently, well, not recently, in the past year, I've been diagnosed with ADHD and obviously, with ADHD, there's a huge part of that is, is related to dopamine. And so to hear that my childhood could have had an impact on my 
release of dopamine in my brain leads me to question the reasoning behind why ADHD is a reality for me. Is it because of this that I have ADHD? The section raises these difficult points and questions though, talks a lot about parents and generational trauma and how that impacts your self-worth and your self-esteem. And I think it's not groundbreaking to say that being brought up in the world that we and I was as a gay person had hugely detrimental impact on my self-worth. In a weird way, I feel like I have this ego or this belief that people are staring at me because they are attracted to me, which definitely comes from the gay world. Everything is about physical appearance, sexual attraction. But then in the same vein, I don't feel like I have things of value to add to conversations. I struggle to put myself out there because my perception of my worth is so low. In the section on page 69, he quotes from a book called Healing the Shame That Binds You by John Bradshaw. He states, we need to know from the beginning that we can trust the world. The world first comes to us in the form of our primary caregivers. We need to know that we can count on someone to be there for us in a humanly predictable manner. If we had a caregiver who was mostly predictable and who touched us and mirrored all our behaviors, we developed a sense of interpersonal bond, which forms a bridge of empathic mutuality. Such a bridge is crucial for the development of self-worth. The only way a child can develop a sense of self is through a relationship with another. We are we before we are I. This links back to something recently someone said in a meeting that I was in that kind of unlocked this potentially emotional thought. And I got near tears in the meeting, but my childhood, and this is no criticism of my parents, but my childhood, love wasn't a open emotion. And that's a lot to do with the trauma that we carried as a family, but also to do with British culture, the stiff upper lip. Love wasn't this constant thing. And so my adulthood struggle with closeness, intimacy, romance, and love is potentially due to that. And then multiplied probably tenfold by the fact that I'm gay and I was taught that gay love is wrong. And so it's just something that's in my head that I'm considering as I read this section. On page 71, Matthew states, if they themselves have not received it from their own parents, they may not be able to give it adequately to their children. From what I know of, of both of my parents' childhoods is that they were difficult. My mum grew up in a very religious Irish household as the only daughter. She had three older brothers. I know that that stuff would have had an impact. And I know my grandma as well. I've met her. I know what she can be like. So I don't hold it against them because I just see the impact of their upbringing. And it's not necessarily a bad thing that my childhood was very logical and pragmatic. And potentially there was not as much kind of intimate displays of love. I still know that they love me. I still know that they care. And there is like subtle displays of love. You know, my mum checking in on me is a display of love. It's not necessarily a bad thing that that is the childhood that I had. It's just different. And then it's made more complex by the fact that I was gay and I was brought up in a world that taught me that my love was wrong. It's just a series of unfortunate events, I think. Ultimately, no one can know. And I'm not going to hold my mum accountable for something that she kind of has no control or perception of. I do think it's important to adequately hold your parents accountable. It's also important to recognize that it's not entirely their fault. And in my situation, I don't blame my mum and I don't hold them accountable for anything because with specifically regarding my situation, it was complex and it wasn't necessarily all bad. It's just certain things have had a knock on effect. We move on to the section fight, flight, and hypervigilance. And in this section, importantly, he defines fight, flight, and then the two following the theoretical responses to danger that have been added, freeze and fawn. However, before I touch upon that, 
he mentions something very apt on page 76. He states, stop and think about that for a moment. This is the truth of our lives. Most of us make it into adulthood where we are, survivors of abuse. But instead of traditional notions of physical or sexual abuse inflicted by individuals, though that may be part of our stories too, this abuse comes in macro form from the whole of society, mired in ignorance at best and willful hatred at worst. What effect does shame have on people? He, in this section, puts a perspective on something that I've believed and known, which is that I was brought up in a society that taught me I was wrong, but he puts it in a perspective that I've never considered, that essentially growing up in that way was surviving a form of abuse. And I've written in my notes that potentially this history of abuse in my life is potentially why I've sought relationships with people that had characteristics that could be defined as abusive. And then beyond that, why I've in my adulthood abused certain things and abused myself. It's a very difficult topic to talk about because abuse is this kind of red flag, this blacked out topic. So often the victim tries to talk about their abuse and it's met with that they are trying to make it all about them or they're trying to make excuses. I'm not trying to make excuses. I take full accountability for the things I've put myself through. I'm recognizing the reasonings that may have led me to do so because though it's important to hold yourself accountable, it's also important to afford yourself some grace, especially in response to things like this. On page 77, Matthew kind of gives reason to this abuse seeking behavior almost. He states, in 99% of people I see with addiction problems, regardless of sexuality, is anxiety. We're so used to being criticized, we become massively hypervigilant and that leads to anxiety. And earlier I spoke about how I was so worried people would find out I was gay when I grew up that I physically changed things about myself, physically and actively changed things about myself that I was worried people would use against me. I was hypervigilant and I taught myself to be anxious. But I mentioned affording yourself some grace, giving yourself a little bit of a break, you know, acknowledging the experiences that you had that led you to where you are and not necessarily regretting them or wishing things were different, but just recognizing that those experiences are what made you today and you to have survived this long are extremely strong because you survived these experiences. He states on 79, I can remember how I felt like it was yesterday. It had a profound impact on me. That intense feeling of public shame, like my legs had been knocked out from under me and I was completely alone. And that comes from Paul, who's talking about an experience of being outed when he was a child. And it makes me want to pause and kind of take reflection on experiences that I had as a child that were very similar, that had what I would say a profound impact on me. I used to go to this youth group when I was around 11 to 13, 14. And in one of the older years of me going there, we were messing about and we were playing pranks on each other. And I was dared to play a prank on this one guy where I put a cup on his head and he flips out and he chases me around the building. And then he says at one point to his friends, why doesn't he just come out already? And it had such a profound impact on me. I remember it hitting me like a ton of bricks. And I had kind of forgotten about this experience until I was reading this, but it hit me like a truck. I was in shock that anyone would even have an inkling that I was gay. I thought I was, you know, hiding it so well, but he wanted to hurt me. He wanted to have a profound impact. So he said something that he knew would shock me and take me aback. And it did. It had a profound impact. Another experience is when I was probably 16, 17, and it was a friend's birthday. So for his birthday, I posted a picture of us together where he looks awful. And coincidentally, that picture was from a sleepover when we'd woken up the morning and he didn't have a top on. I remember I posted it for his birthday and the next day my mom calls me into her bedroom. She tries to have this kind of conversation about how I should take it down because people will think things and she's giving me this lecture and I, 
I start to chat back and I'm like, well, if people think things, then they're wrong. And I was so deeply in the closet at this point. She says that people might get the wrong impression. I reply to her, it doesn't matter if they've got the wrong impression, they can ask me about it and I'll correct them. And if they don't ask me about it, then they don't matter, which is a, a pretty good mentality to have, but it, it ended up in a shouting match. She shouted at me, I guess you're just not as streetwise as you think you are. And I retorted, I guess you're just not as progressive as you think you are. And I stormed out. And to this day, that, that has a huge impact on me. And I, again, I don't hold my mom accountable. She was looking out for me. She had my best interests in mind. I then had to retrospectively fill my mom in later on, but I wasn't out and it kind of shook me that my mum would hold that kind of perception that if people thought I was gay, that I should not want that. Well, she then defines the freeze and fawn responses to danger. We all know fight or flight and freeze is essentially playing small or staying still in response to, to danger. However, I am definitely a fauna. I'm a people pleaser. He defines fauna as when an animal is under threat rather than fight, take flight or freeze, it may choose to fawn, to submit to the predator and almost beg for mercy. Either by people pleasing or by trying to make others laugh, people pleasers are those who always put the needs of others first. They do everything they can to help others so that people will like them. You'll also know that many people humiliate themselves, act the clown, send themselves up to make others laugh at them rather than attack them. And I've already spoken about hamming up campness and playing into homophobia and how I, I definitely did that. I'm also a people pleaser, but I also definitely would humiliate myself or kind of tell stories. I was a class clown for sure. Even at uni, I would tell stories that were so embarrassing. I was just telling them for no reason. And obviously they came up again and it's almost like humiliating myself so that people are laughing at me and I can pretend that they're laughing with me. The last section of this part is called unsafe at school. On page 84, at the start of the section, he quotes Margaret Thatcher, the famous quote about the inalienable right to be gay. What I didn't know is that earlier in the quote, she states, too often our children don't get the education they need, the education they deserve. And I've just written in my notes on, on the book, she was actually so close to being correct. She was so close to having it right. Yeah, people aren't getting the right education that they need or deserve. Gay people aren't getting the education that they need or deserve. This section has the absolute most that I could talk about. I think the discussion of LGBTQ plus issues in relation to education and school is so important and still very relevant today. On page 87, he makes an extremely important point, which is that it's my view that suicide by LGBT kids is massively underreported for this very reason. And I just agree wholeheartedly. When you're in it and when you've been there as a gay person, when you've sat at your bedroom windowsill wondering if the jump would kill you, you know this problem is wider than it seems. People who aren't in it find it hard to believe in and probably grasp and maybe they're resistant when gay people try to imply that there are a lot more gay people than reported and visible. But so many teen suicides and so many adult suicides as well have a connection to our rigid binary view of sexuality and gender. And they're misrepresented because we don't know what's going on in their heads. We don't know why someone would choose to do that. And there could be a whole long list of reasons. Matthew specifically refers to suicide in LGBT kids is massively underreported. It's because we can't necessarily imply that certain children who we don't know about are committing suicide before they come out. And so we can't statistically list them as an LGBT suicide. If we were to take a realistic view, it's, it's probably much bigger than, than we think. On page 89 to 91, he defines the factors of homophobic bullying. He lists shame, self-acceptance, parental difference, denial potential, victim blaming, ignorance, and homophobia. He states, a key point I want to make in this book is that accepting you are LGBT is not just difficult because of overt outside influences. It is hard being different. I'm going to repeat that last bit. It is hard being different. 
And that is not just related to LGBT, sexuality, gender, whatever. Simply put, it is hard being different. And being different in the world that we live in has an impact. He does go on to talk about parental difference. And he does make an important point about how homophobia or response to LGBT discussions, and especially in schools, has a certain belief-led aspect where people who are homophobic, parents who hold these homophobic beliefs, are in a sense allowed to hold these beliefs. There is a certain element of homophobia where it is allowed to happen because freedom of speech, freedom to believe. And Matthew uses the kind of counter example of racism and how parents' responses in schools to a child receiving racist bullying would be very different to a child receiving homophobic bullying. And I think though that is an apt point, I do raise the concern of a white author using the example of racism to justify his point about homophobia. I don't necessarily think he needs to have a counter example. He can kind of just make the point, which is homophobia is met with a response that is almost allowed to happen because homophobia is not seen as a disgusting, oppressive opinion. It's seen as a belief that can be held, a almost valid belief. And on this topic, homophobic bullying, he makes a really impactful statistic, which is that there are more than 25,000 schools in the UK. In 2015, DRM was working with 130 of them, Stonewall with a thousand. The majority of schools are left to make their own way with only the guidance issued to them by the government. All of these statistics that he's been quoting prior to this point about homophobic bullying in schools is taken from reports that at maximum only use 1,200 of the schools in the UK, but there are 25,000 schools in the UK and majority of them can just listen to what the government says and whether they're putting it into action, who knows? I went to a Catholic school and they're definitely not putting this stuff into action. Granted, I left that school a few years ago, so things might have changed. However, they didn't celebrate Red Nose Day because Red Nose Day supports contraception and contraception goes against what the Bible says. Matthew in the book talks about multiple examples of teachers bullying students and that happened to me. My form tutor would talk about me from across the room in conversations that I wasn't in. He'd make jokes about me in conversations that I wasn't a part of and I'd just hear a group of people giggling about me and he would be the one leading the charge. So this idea that there are so many schools that don't listen to the government or that aren't enacting a lot of this guidance from places like Stonewall is 100% believable because I experienced it. Matthew talks about the ambiguity and vagueness of the government's guidance. He invited political party leaders to meet parents of kids who had died as a result of homophobic bullying. He states, Ed Miliband agreed, but David Cameron and Nick Clegg declined. Clegg wrote saying that the coalition government had given an extra £1 million to the charity Beat Bullying. So I called the charity and asked how they dealt with homophobia. They said they'd call me back. They didn't. He touches upon a really important point, which is that homophobic bullying ends up getting grouped in with just regular bullying and action and guidance specifically regarding homophobic bullying, transphobic bullying is just not dealt with with the gravity and weight that it should be. Because with all LGBTQ plus issues, there is this air of apathy that society seems to have. There is this air of exhaustion that we're making it all about us. But we are being loud and vocal because these things have an impact. And even in the recent news, the story of Rihanna Guy is just prime example of what happens when we don't treat these issues with the gravity they deserve. And then just to link it all back to my earlier point about Maggie Thatcher and how close she was to saying the right thing, people aren't getting the education they deserve. And that is definitely true. LGBTQ plus children 
or even children that will grow up to come out and realize that they are LGBTQ+, they are not getting the education they deserve. And we're led to just deal with it on our own. I grew up and I had to teach myself about gay stuff, gay issues. YouTube was a safe haven for me. On page 95, he talks about this, but education on gay issues related to sexual health and sex itself is just not prevalent enough. I had to teach myself about anal, douching, gay sex practices, safe sex, HIV. I didn't even know about 72 hours PEP until a friend of mine at uni took it just in case and told me what it was. I had heard of PrEP when it was coming out because I'd heard of the trials, but none of this I was taught. It was all through the grapevine or through social media, especially through YouTube, like the gay influencers on YouTube. That connects really well to something that I'm writing or something that I had been writing but have neglected recently. I was writing essentially a autobiographical book that I had entitled no one teaches young gay boys the dangers of dating because I genuinely and firmly hold the belief that a lot of my negative experiences of relationships, of sex and of dating could have been avoided had I been taught the certain dangers. There's no handbook or rule book and maybe that's why I'm making this podcast because maybe by me talking about it and me sharing my experience, I can at least help others to avoid the same traps. Before I end this episode, because I am completely aware that is extremely long, I just wanted to quote something on page 100. Matthew talks about the story of Mark who had killed himself. His mum refers to a question that she used to be asked when she was young, which is, is it the end of the world? And it connects to something that my parents used to say to me, whenever I got minutely hurt not if I got greatly hurt but if I got a paper cut they would ask will you live and it's kind of an ongoing in joke that we have but now that I think about it seeing that question in the book of is it the end of the world that ethos of will you live you know just get on with it kind of you'll be fine has served me really well it's allowed me to keep going and not give up but it's also driven a lot of how I've coped. I've pushed things to the side. I've pushed things down because I'll live. I'll get over it. But I don't process the things. I just push them away. In that story of Mark, she states, I've tried to explain it to my other son. I was born with two arms. I'm really grateful that I've still got one arm. But every morning you wake up and you realize you haven't got that other arm. So I tend to put a false arm on, eyelashes, makeup. But each morning, when you get up, you're still reminded that your arm is not there. Mark is not there. Obviously, I have a lot to say about this section of the book, which, by the way, is one third of the book. There's so much to take away. There's so much that I resonated with and that I can apply to my own life. And I hope that section has provided you something. But I just wanted to end on this quote, which will be the number one quote that I take away from reading this book. On page 56, he states, Love is fundamentally pivotal to the survival of all human beings. And that is crucial to understand. You have to afford yourself love and you have to be open to love itself. We as gay people were taught as young children that we were unlovable and unworthy of love. And we have to put in active effort to heal that inner child and not allow that damage to fester because if we don't we risk falling into several dark habits this has been saying something sober keeping me sober 249 days as of recording episode 7a